Okay, uh, so it's uh, 6 p.m. so we can uh, start um, with uh, today's lecture. So first welcome to everybody to uh, the new week of uh, the activities of Belgrade the Sports Medicine eForum. So today uh, with us we have Professor Dr. Johannes Toll. So I want to take a chance and congratulate the Professor Toll for becoming the first professor, professor from the Specialization, specialization of sports medicine in the Amsterdam UMC. So congratulations from the behalf of the Belgrade Sports Medicine eForum. So Professor Toll is a sports medicine physician uh, who is also the clinical research coordinator at Aspeter, a senior associate uh, editor at British Journal of Sports Medicine and chief doctor for young football players at Ajax. Uh, today's lecture will be titled Acute Hamstring Injuries. So without further delay, Professor Toll, you can start with uh, the lecture and after that we will have a discussion with the public. So thank you very much for the introduction and uh, you just called me Hans. Uh, and I'm also a former football player, so I still want to be in the, the changing room. And I want to thank you all for sending Dusan Taric to Amsterdam. Uh, because he made a big change uh, over the last season. As a professional player, he learned a lot our youngsters. So most of the youngsters, they can play football, but he also teaches them how to be a professional. So uh, thanks for that, for sending him to, from Serbia to, uh, to Holland to teach the young guys. Yeah, well, you're welcome. So today we will talk about hamstring injuries. And let's see if it's working. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we have to do it over here. So I tried to answer together with you five important questions. And the first question is, is there any injury which shouldn't be missed when you work at a club, when you work in a hospital or when you work at a federation? And we're going to start with this very, very uncommon injury. But you have to remember that's a red flag. So it's only 3% of the hamstring injuries. These are serious, serious injuries which shouldn't be missed. And normally we speak a lot about the simple hamstring injuries, but the first two or three minutes we will talk about the red flag in hamstring injuries. Mostly that's a stretch injury. So an acute stretch injury of the hamstrings, but you can have with water skiing, and like in Serbia, of course, you also have snow slipping away on snow or in your bathroom. That might be a trauma mechanism for a serious, serious injury. And that serious injury is the hamstring avulsion. And it's always proximal. So it's always at this side. And what patients report to you that they've got, especially in the first days, but also up to two or three months, pain while sitting. That is completely different with the other injuries. And if you're lucky, you'll see a hematoma or bruising. And in these cases, there's a decreased strength. And if you're a little bit more experienced, you can also palpate that there's a gap at the insertion. So this case is easy because then you see bruising at the spot of the injury because here's proximal, that's where the hamstring attach and then you see bruising over here. These cases, yeah, we, we will not miss them. But you also have cases like this when they present after two or three weeks, then there's also only a hematoma at the back of the knee and this is even pronounced, but I've seen cases when there's just a little bit bruising at the back of the knee. And then it's not our first reaction to think about an injury which is proximal. So bruising also when it's distal and even now then when it's absent, we always have to think about a proximal injury of the hamstring. And so for clinical practice, I always start in each patient with palpation at the proximal insertion. That's, that's more or less my standardized uh, approach because otherwise I'm a little bit afraid to miss these very, very uncommon injuries. Only 3% of them. But if you miss them, uh, you can be in trouble. So here you see it again. 
This is an, uh, an bicep, so then you've got the tendon. Over here is the free tendon. Uh, on this side, you see the tendon connecting to the tuber, so that's all good. But on the other side, over here, there's a gap. And especially in elite athletes or very active persons, these cases might get an operation. So in English. Mm -hmm. So, and what we found out in our own clinic, and what you here see is on the on this axis on the y axis, how long it take before they have the injury and they present at the hospital, and that we found out that there are many many cases. They present after five weeks, 10 weeks, some even after years. However, if you are a medical doctor or a physical therapist, then you're over here. So that means when you're specialized, then you're lucky because then you think about the injury and then you seek help. But these cases, and that's in the normal population, we can miss them easily. So that's why I wanted to start with the red flag. The red flag is stretch injury with pain on the proximal insertion. But it's only 3% of the cases. And what are we going to do now? Now we switch to the other 97% of the cases. So the regular hamstring injuries we see at the club, we see at the association, and which we see in the clinics. And especially when you work uh, with elite athletes. I remember from Espata in Qatar, but in Holland is more or less the same. Even before they get injured, the elite athletes, they will ask, when can I get my MRI? Because MRI, it's very, very important for most elite athletes. So we first gonna focus on when can I get my MRI? And so when you look at the literature, what is the optimal timing for doing an MRI after an hamstring injuries? And if you look at this slide, some will say, okay, you have to do it within one or two days. Others would say, okay, you can wait till five days. And others say, oh no, you have to do it within 24 hours. But that was all based on nothing. That is more an opinion than it was based on, uh, on evidence. So what we did at Espeta, well, we've got, we are lucky to have a lot of possibilities to do scans on a regular basis. We had 15 uh, elite athletes and they had every day a scan. So they were injured, they were brought to the clinic within 24 hours and then they were scanned during the week on the same time uh, after injury. So over here on the left side, you see several cases on day one and on the right side, day seven. And if you have a look at these slides, then you can learn, yeah, what I see on day one, here, day one is more or less the same than what I see on day seven, and also on day four. So the important message from this slide is that it doesn't matter when you do your MRI, you can do it within 24 hours, you can do it after seven days, you can do it at three days, so relax, there's no stress to do it in the urgent acute situation. And other would say, okay, this is just edema. I wanna have a look if there's a muscle tear. And this slide shows more or less the same. Here we've got all the cases and this is the average. And what you see, even when you look at the muscle tears, you can detect them within 24 hours up till seven days. And there's no change over time. So the question, when can I get my MRI? It's very simple. You can do it on each day. So if you've got an elite athlete who wants to have an MRI after injury, relax, you can do it during the first week. So then we got the second question, and that is a very important question for the elite athletes, also for recreational athletes and for the coach. And that question is, when can I play? And also this question you will get 
within one hour after the injury. And we did this systematic review some years ago and that we found that there's no strong evidence for any MRI finding. And then I was lucky to work in Espeta and there we had one professor and he had a famous uh, quote and he always said, bye bye MRI. And this famous professor is on this slide. I learned from Professor Popovich, not only for the hamstring, but to be a good clinician, you first have to do a good clinical examination. And then we came more or less up with this uh, quote, which was more or less stolen from Professor Popovich. And it's about predicting MRI, of predicting return to play after hamstring injury. And then we would say, bye bye MRI. And I'm going to show you why we still can say bye bye MRI when we talk about predicting. So not about diagnosis, but about predicting. So thank you, Professor Popovich, for that we could use your quote, bye bye MRI. So then we go to clinical practice. So in an ideal world, when we've got an hamstring injury, in an ideal world, we would grade them is with grade one, the minor injuries, the grade two with uh, fiber disruptions, and the grade three, these are the red flags. And in an ideal world, they will all have their own return to play period. So for example, a grade one in an ideal world will take two weeks, a grade two will take in an ideal world six weeks, and a grade three in an ideal world three months. But let's see how it works in daily clinical practice. We know from the big UEFA studies that the mean return to play with a grade one, that's on this side, is between one and 37 days. Oops, that's a quite wide range. And the same is true for the grade two, between two and 37 days. And what you can learn from this slide is that there's a wide overlap between the grade one and zero, or a grade one and two. So they're merging together. So that means you can have a your clinic, at the club, at your association, a player who has a grade two hamstring injury, for example, with football, with an earlier return to play than a grade one, because there's a wide overlap between the return to play between these MRI grades. So then just focus on when you see on MRI, there's fiber disruption. So there's edema with fiber disruption. And again, what we can learn from the study from Accent, there's a wide range of return to play period within that grade. So when you work with a coach like Mourinho, you would say, okay, I've looked in the literature, I did my MRI. And I think based on the best available evidence, I think your player will be back on the field between two, maybe 42 days. So then you're fired. Eh? And why is it so difficult to predict return to play? This is an, uh, a nice uh, model for predicting return to play. And then you see there are lots, a lot of factors. This is the clinical side, but here are other sites and return to play is not only influenced by the MRI, not only influenced by the mechanism, but also from the pressure from the coach. Are you playing next week Champions League or national game? Are you into judo or into basketball? So there are a lot of other factors which we don't see on MRI. And over the last three, four years, there's a lot of attention to the intramuscular tendon injury. I'm going to show you an example of that that you all see over here. So this is the tendon, that's the free tendon, and then it goes inside, we call it the intramuscular tendon. So there's a lot of attention on 
this intramuscular tendon and what we can learn from the studies from Britain is when this tendon is ruptured, the return to play is not 20 days, but it's 60 days. And when this tendon is ruptured, the re-injury rate is up to 63%. And then there were many publications on it, also the BGSM, where they found that the return to play with a disruption of the central tendon is much longer. So Peter Bruckner said, okay, this is a serious, a very serious thigh muscle injury. We have to be aware of it because they are completely different than the rest. Five studies based on 27 retrospective cases. So we all jumped in that direction. That's a serious injury. And then when we look, when we have a closer look, then we will see it was only about 27 cases. And here you got the same. So based on all these cases, the return to play will be between 18 days and 128 days. Again, a wide range. And even when you tell it to Mourinho, he will not be happy. And he will never be happy. Okay, data from Espada, fresh data, where we looked at the intramuscular tendon injury. On the left, you see the tendon is normal. And on the right one, yes, there's an intratendon muscle injury. Again, you see over here, there's a wide range. Oops. And there's an overlap. So this serious injury is probably not as serious as we expected before because the mean difference is only maybe one week. And again, you can have guys or girls with an injury, intramuscular tendon injury will return earlier even when they don't have it. So again, MRI does not give us the right answer. Nevertheless, tomorrow morning, you're back in clinical practice and then you'll have done your clinical exam and then you've got your MRI and then you will have a look at the MRI and you're going to measure everything you can. So that means you want to know what's the grading, the extent of edema, the extent of disruption, the location, the free tendon involvement, whatever you want, it is measured. But before the athlete enters your clinic, then you know already the mean of the return to play for these normal hamstring injuries is between one and 45 days. And now we're gonna add the MRI. And this is what's gonna happen. So instead it's 95% is within one and 45 days. It's between five and 42 days. Again, we measured everything we could on MRI. And at the end, you only narrow it a little, a little bit. Okay. Then back to 20 years ago, when there was almost no MRI, we had our hands and we had at that time, it's, I'm a little bit skeptical about that because clinical examination the attention to it is decreasing. But nevertheless, uh, I think you're all trained, well trained, and you all can do your clinical examination. And this is where you add your clinical examination when a player enters your clinic. This is much better. Eh? Instead of a prediction between one and 45 days, just with simple clinical examination, you can say more or less it's three weeks plus or minus five days. So the key message from this slide is trust on your clinical examination because it will give you much, much more information than an MRI and most likely it's also cheaper. So this is about the conventional MRI. Uh, I'm going to show you one slide because even with these not that good uh, results. We are working on a new MRI. 
and I'm gonna show you on this slide. So this is the, the conventional MRI, where we see at an injury site, we see fluid. So that's a secondary sign of the injury. When there's an injury, we can see some edema. But what we want to see is the muscle fibers. So this is a new MRI technique. It's fiber tracking with DTI. You can see the fibers and then you can see the fibers after they have, are injured. So we don't see edema, we see the injured fibers and then you see the uh, fibers after recovery. So to summarize it, I would say bye-bye for prediction uh, for the MRI, but we shouldn't say bye-bye for the future because I think there are still some good uh, examples that we can probably increase the use and the value of MRI. But at this age, of this stage, you have to press on your clinical exam. So, and then uh, we go two or three weeks further. So we had an injury and then a player is more or less fit to return to play, we think. And that is, our opinion is crucial. I always tell to uh, colleagues when we work at the club, the first injury, the first injury is always the problem of the coach. He trained too hard, he put too much pressure on it, and it was his problem. Of course, it's not the truth, but that is how it works when you work in professional football. But then at return to play, when you've got a re-injury within two months, which is very coming, common, then it's not the problem of the coach, then it's the problem of the medical staff. Because everybody thinks that we are responsible for the re-injuries. So let's have a look if we can just a little bit better, because we have to make a very important decision at return to play if somebody is uh, fit to return to play or not. We're going to discuss in the upcoming minutes measuring muscle strength. Then again, we're going to see what MRI will add. And then I'm going to discuss a rehab program. So this is a paper out uh, from 2014. Um, and at that time, so uh, nine, 10 years ago, we always believe that when a player returns to play on isokinetic testing, the difference should be less than 10% compared to the contralateral leg. That is more or less a gold standard in sports medicine. And then we did a study where we measured it, but we didn't take it in account with our uh, return to play decision. And we found that players playing in the Qatar League, that two out of three, they are returning to play and they still have an isokinetic deficit of 10%. But they finish three times training with the team without injury and they return to full uh, competition. Nevertheless, two out of three had an isokinetic difference of more than 10%. And what we can learn from this, that's what we see on the field is much, much more important than what we thought about the strength deficits. So forget a 10% strength deficit, you can measure it and get the player motivated to restore it, but don't use it as a return to play criteria. It will not help the player. Again, the crystal ball, and this crystal ball is still MRI. So what do we see at return to play at MRI? On the left side, you see the injury with a lot of edema. And then at return to play, there's still edema in 90 till 100% of the cases. And it's also over here. You can have even fibrosis. And what you can remember from this slide is at return to play, 
the MRI will always be abnormal and it will not help you to make solely based on the MRI the best decision. So regarding strengths, this is what we analyzed already, isokinetic testing, the Nord board, so eccentric strengths has become more and more important. We are now analyzing it. Hopefully next year we're gonna present it. The H test from my uh, Carl Asling, probably you will use it in the clinic. Uh, we're gonna test it also and probably also next year we will have data on these tests because they are also very easy to perform in daily clinical practice. Return to play uh, decision is always difficult. And it's especially difficult if you start thinking about return to play, if you're near return to play. So my message is return to play starts one minute after injury. So after injury, you have to have a plan and you'll gradually go to the return to play decision and the rehab program can help you. There's a lot of information on this, but when we have a closer look, and that's the message from uh, uh, the slides on the rehab, is that we, what we see at Espital, we had six stages. And on every stage, we had some criteria to pro progress. So not only at the end of the return to play, where you have to make a difficult decision, but it's better for each stage to make the good decision. So once you are at return to play, you already thought about return to play from the start and you already use criteria to progress from the start. So then you've got much, much more control uh, on the recovery uh, than when you only think about it at return to play. This protocol is free available on the uh, internet, also on the ESPTA uh, YouTube channel. And for me, it really helped me in daily clinical practice because you've got some more tools to measure the recovering during the process and you're not forced to make a single decision at return to play. Yeah, and then the summary is of course from, um, can we use MRI and isokinetic testing at return to play? No, you have to use other criteria and a criteria based rehab program might help you in daily clinical practice. And then I mentioned it already, after return to play, we medical staff, we are blamed for the re-injuries. So let's have a look when they occur. So the red one, uh, sorry, on the, the y-axis, we see the proportion of re-injuries. So this is 100%, 0%. And here we see the weeks between return to play and re-injury. So this is at return to play, and this is uh, 15 weeks, uh, almost one year after return to play. And what we can learn from this slide, is in the early five weeks, it's all red and very busy over here. That means the most re-injuries are at the same location in the same muscle. So the early re-injuries, same location, same muscle. Within five weeks, 50% of the re-injuries. So now this is more or less the same slide, but then on the x-axis, it's the time between injury, not the time from return to play, but the time from injury till the first uh, re-injury. And again, it's the same, all re-injuries in the first period. 50% within 50 days after injury, or 50% after five weeks after return to play. It's very easy to remember. And the reason for these early re-injuries, it might be that the injury is not fully recovered or there are other factors. And uh, 
I think we don't have the answer to all these re-injuries at this stage. In summary, uh, the re-injuries, 50% within 50 days after injury, 50% within five weeks after return to play, and one out of five will re-injury within two months. So in summary, uh, when we talk about hamstring injuries, and there's not that much attention in the literature, but always, always think about a full rupture, a full tendon avulsion. And what really helped me in daily clinical practice that I always start uh, palpating on the proximal insertion, even when they present with bruising more distally. Focus on the proximal insertion. And in 97% of the cases, 97 of 100 of the cases, there will be no full rupture, but you will never miss it when you got intention to it. So when can I get my MRI? I hope that you all learned that you can do it on each day. When can I play again? Then you have to remember the words of Professor Popovich, bye-bye MRI for predicting return to play. And it's all about working with your hands and with your brain rely on clinical examination at return to play it's still difficult the key message is there don't start thinking about return to play when you're already at return to play but use criteria during your rehab process we are blamed for the re-injuries so you have to be more or less be aware when do they occur 50 percent within 50 days after injuries and 50% within five weeks after return to play. Um, to close this lecture, um, I want to pay attention to this, the Muscle Injury Clinical Guide. There's also an update in 2018. It's free, and when you go on, uh, on Google, FC Barcelona Muscle Injury Clinical Guide, you can download it for free. And thank you for your attention. And I think we are now open for questions. Uh, yes. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now ask uh, all the audience to uh, ask question to Hans. So now Professor Dalton Hans. Uh, so you have uh, two options. Uh, the one is when you click on participants, you will have the option raise hand. And when you raise hand, I will get the notification. So uh, I will call your name and you can ask a question to professor directly. Uh, or you can also uh, send the question in uh, the chat section. So I will then read your question. Uh, but before we start, I would like just to say a few hellos to first Professor Evelyn Quidi and uh, Professor Nicholas uh, Quiltanus from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Both are the sports medicine professors there. And to Dr. Adam Weir and William Hayboyer from the uh, Groin Center in Aspeter. So they are also joining us. We have like the worldwide uh, audience uh, here. So I will just leave this... Um, all screen uh, uh, section and let me see if somebody is ready to ask question to Hans. So once again, you can raise your hand uh, or uh, write the question in the chat section. It will give the audience a bit of the time. Okay. Let me see. Mm. Yeah, still no hand that is raised and no, no questions in the group chat. Okay, let me see now, just to go through all participants. Basically, everything was so clear. Okay, there is one hand. Uh, so, uh, Nikol Topalovich, 
Nikola is a sports medicine specialist from uh, Serbia, from Belgrade, also a colleague of mine. He's working as the assistant to, at the uh, medical physiology department. So Nikola, you can turn on your microphone and ask a question to Hans. Uh, hello to everybody. Thank you, Professor, for this uh, amazing lecture. I will also want to thank you again to Professor Popovic and Professor Mazic for all of this. I have uh, one question. Uh, you spoke about hamstring injury, but you uh, didn't tell about treatment. Uh, is uh, it only uh, surgical treatment or uh, hamstring injury with uh, physical uh, treatment? Uh, if some player need a surgical treatment, uh, in how many percent they uh, increase uh, percentage of re-injury and uh, also uh, when we can expect uh, returning to play if he need a surgical treatment for hamstring injury. Thank yeah, you. So, yeah, thank you. I think this question especially focused on the first part there where I discussed 3% might have a complete avulsion and this is a mostly stretch, uh, stretch injuries. <clears throat> Uh, it's a very uncommon injury, uh, but based on uh, the data we have back home in Amsterdam, uh, there we always sit together with the, uh, with the athlete, and most elite athletes, yes, they will end up in surgery. So for the elite athletes, uh, most will end up in elite surgery, of uh, elite athletes will end up with surgery. Nevertheless, uh, it's a, for me, uh, working daily clinical practice, I see that a complete avulsion uh, affects your career more than an ACL. So that's what I see in daily clinical practice. And one of the reasons is that they will never return at the level before regarding sprinting. And that's what we also see uh, in the clinical follow-up. Yes, they can restore their strengths uh, up to some degree. Some they will even reach uh, 100% but they all said, I'm not as fast as I have been before. And, and also the strength deficit, even guys, they train, they train, they train, they will, uh, not all will return to the same strengths. And I think that the, the main reason for that is, yes, it's a rupture of the tendon, but it's also a rupture of all these fire of uh, nerves connecting to the, to the, to the tendon and not all will restore again. And then when we compare the elite athletes with the recreational ones who don't have access to a daily uh, strength program, who are not that active for recovery, we only see, also see that they will never reach the same strengths. And even some, when they are not training on, on a daily basis, the muscle will, uh, decrease in volume. So yes, it's a serious injury. Yes, uh, elite athletes can return to play at pre-injury level. Most of them will report, yes, but um, my feeling is that I'm not as quick as before. And for me, uh, that's what I really learned from these cases. During the career, it affects them probably more, especially in football, I'm from football. It, it, it affects them more uh, than an ACL injury. Okay, thank you a lot. Okay, uh, thank you, Nicola. Uh, also, there is a hand raised by Professor Sasha Buman from the University of Niche, Faculty of Sports and Physical Education. Sasha, you can turn on your microphone and ask question to Hans. <laughs> okay, uh, dear Professor, thank you for this wonderful lecture. I would also like to thank to Professor Popovic, Professor Mazic and Professor Rakic for uh, giving us opportunity to participate to this uh, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is for, uh, is, will be given as follow. Uh, do you include uh, a motor control in real, uh, real learning uh, movement pattern in injured athletes. Um, 
we all know that it is only a game between antagonist muscles of uh, the quadriceps and uh, hamstrings and uh, the moment of relaxi relaxation of uh, hamstrings during the uh, forward step, for example, during the running. This, uh, these injuries occur if uh, hamstring muscle, muscles are not uh, relaxed at the same moment. And uh, in mo most cases, it is the same membranosis that uh, is uh, injured. So in this uh, rehabilitation process, do you include real learning of the motor pattern, movement pattern? And do you include the motor control? Yeah, it's a, it's a nice question. And uh, I'll be very honest, I'm a very simple guy. So uh, it's always difficult to say what is motor learning. For, uh, what is really important for me after, especially these uh, sprinting injuries, and then you will have a new situation. And most important for when I supervise these rehabs is that they go as soon as possible uh, to the injury situation. So when it was a sprinting injury, I hope that they can start already with uh, jogging a little bit on day one and with a lot of attention on uh, uh, return to sprinting. And regarding sprinting, that's now, now we, I work at the football club where we uh, got a lot of coaches who came from uh, athletics. So uh, we are there in a position that they can focus more on, and that's what you said, is how to learn again sprinting after uh, a previous injury. And some of them, and that's very difficult, they also have to adapt their running technique uh, during the rehab. But how long, of how far we, of how much we can change it, and that's always uh, very difficult. So if I, I don't know if we got, can change it, but the key is to go back to your injury mechanism and start learning as much as possible and as soon as possible. But that's more based on clinical experience and I've got data on it. Thank you, Professor. You were wonderful. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Sasha. So uh, one more hand is raised, and after that we will go to chat uh, questions. So Lana Kurzman, also one of the uh, sports medicine specialists here in Belgrade, uh, has raised hand. Lana, you can uh, turn on your microphone and ask uh, Hans whatever you want. I did it. Hello, Bilja. Hello, Professor Stoll, Professor Popovic, and Professor Mazic, of course. Uh, I have a question. I read paper that uh, self-estimation for returning to play of hamstring injury is very important. And I'm wondering um, how much previous hamstring injury impact that estimation that to return to play. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so that's, uh, thank you for answering the good question. Uh, so in the, some years ago, we merged everything we could do uh, um, from an athlete. And I think what I really learned from that, but also uh, over, over the years afterwards, uh, about prediction, there's only one person who really can predict, and that's the athlete himself. And, and you will know when you work in a, in, a, in a club, especially these guys who had these injuries two or three times before, they will mostly know at the end of the first week, okay, this will take me two or three weeks or this will take me four or five weeks and it's more maybe because in if it's because it's in their head mm -hmm. but their prediction is much much important more important than all these difficult stuff we do so the message is just listen to your athlete he will give you the answer Mm -hmm. But uh, is the, that experience of previous injury in uh, some player impact that or just their feelings? Yeah, so that, that's, we just ask them, okay, uh, you've got an injury, how long it will take before you return to play? And then besides that, we did strength measurement, we did our own prediction, it's, we did MRI. And one of the best factors was just ask them how long it will take. Uh, they were, uh, that was the strongest predictor. 
so we are not important. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's. I think that's always good to remember that as a doctor, you're not that important as you might think <laughs> about yourself. Mm -hmm. But but that's a personal opinion. Thank you. Professor. Yeah, listen to the athlete. He will give you the answer. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Lana. So, uh, Professor Popovich also raised hand. Professor, you can turn on your microphone and ask questions. Uh, Hans, uh, please, could you share your knowledge about PRP in the treatment of uh, hamstring injury? Because I think that's going to be very interesting for the audience to have uh, to share your knowledge. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, Short answer, very short answer, then uh, is bye-bye PRP. So uh, to be honest, I can't add more on it uh, when you look at hamstring injuries. We all think it, will wor it, it works, but when you look at the, uh, at the literature, it does not work for hamstring injuries. So there is very easy answer. Don't use it. Uh, if you want to have them back on the field very early because it will not help. Uh, Thank you very uh, much. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, for the question. And also, the PRP was a subject uh, of the question from uh, one uh, doctor from Latvia, so Git uh, Mardovic. Uh, he was uh, asking. Uh, if the PRP plays the same role in return to plane, but also if the additional sciatic nerve injury affects treatment and return. Oh, sorry, the last part I missed. Uh, last part, uh, so uh, does the additional sciatic nerve injury affects treatment and return to play? Yeah, so the sciatic nerve injury, especially at, at least in my clinic, we only see it, especially in the complete ruptures, and that is terrible. Uh, really, really terrible. So when you've got in an elite athlete, uh, a tendon rupture with effect, also affecting the, the, uh, the nerve, that's really terrible. Uh, now then you can have the edema, which compressing a little bit to the uh, sciatic nerve, that will recover. But when there's a real uh, uh, injury to the nerve, yeah, it's, it's cut us off. And in the, the, the smaller injuries, that's always a discussion. If, it's, uh, if the nerve could get involved, I don't have a good uh, answer on that question. But for the complete avulsions, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's terrible to have an, uh, a nerve injury. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for the answer. There is also a question from uh, Branka Mladenovic. Uh, do you use ultrasound in diagnostic? Uh, a little bit. Um, to be honest, uh, we are not uh, experienced enough. But I, uh, you know, when I speak about myself, but also about the other, uh, most other sportsmen and physicians in Holland, compared when you compare it to, I know in Spain they are very experienced. I try to learn it myself, but I'm I don't rely on myself. So. But that's more, tells you more about me and other colleagues in Holland than about the value of ultrasound. Because uh, I think the main advantage of ultrasound is that you, you have an extra hand during the, uh, the recovery process. So you can have your criteria, but you can also have, if you've got it uh, at the club, to monitor recovery on ultrasound. So I think it has a great additional value but I am not experienced with the ultrasound to trust it on myself. Uh, okay, thank you. So that was the answer for uh, Branka's question. Also, there is a question from one young doctor. He's volunteering currently at the Children Orthopedics. So here is his comment. Thank you, Professor, for such an amazing lecture. I was wondering if adductor magnus muscle injuries at its proximal attachment point uh, could produce a pain both in gluteal and groin region. Thank you in advance. So the adductor magnus, uh, that is only what I can recall uh, from all these injuries we had. Uh, I think 
one or two, so one or two percent out of hundred, so two percent, they uh, ended up not being an hamstring injury, but an uh, adductor magnus injury. So, yeah, it's very closely related, and especially uh, when you're uh, ten years ago, when I was absolutely not experienced with these um, hamstring injuries, you can easily mix them up with the uh, with the typical hamstring injury. So it's a good question. But the numbers are so small, uh, at least what I saw in, in clinics, that it's very difficult to say if they have a better prognosis or not. But my feeling, based on absolutely uh, no data, is that the adductor magnus uh, recovers a little bit uh, quicker than the semi group. But that's a feeling and it's not based on any data. Well, uh, okay, so that was the question for uh, Philip, uh, the answer to Philip's question. Thank you for that. And we have from uh, Milos, uh, is a hamstring injury more common in players that have problems with anterior pelvic tilt or lumbar hyperlordosis? Yeah, that's a really nice question. Uh, because yes, it's in my head, it's like this. And, and But then you're always searching for evidence to support it and I'm not 100% sure but I think her name was Schuurmans. Uh, she worked together with uh, Erik Wittfrau and I think she showed that at least players who had a previous injury they had a uh, different pelvic tilt than the guys who did not have an injury. So yes it's our feeling from clinical practice that it will affect uh, it's also what you see in, uh, especially in track and field athletes. Uh, and there's some support from the evidence from Belgium that it might really affect. And also for me, in daily clinic practice, it's the first uh, thing I do, standing position, to have a look at the lumbar spine. And these two important cases which were mentioned, uh, it's based on clinical experience, but data for doing it might be only that from Belgium. Uh, okay, thank you for the answer. There is also one more hand that is raised, the so from Eric. Eric, you can turn on your microphone and ask a question to Hans. Okay. Okay, I can unmute. Uh, one so uh, Eric has raised the hand, so you can turn on the microphone and ask the question. Mm, well, there is some problem. Well, maybe. It was the accidentally turned on or lost the connection, but still I have the notification that the hand is raised. Okay, once more call for Eric. Okay, here. Hello, Eric, you can ask your question. No, we don't hear anything. Okay, is there maybe some more question in the chat section you can send uh, there? For now, nothing. So we got one thank you from Branka from, for answering her question. I think everybody's hungry, eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, they were active this week in this chat section. Yeah. So mostly are people that cannot uh, get on the microphone. Okay, there is one more hand that is raised, Milena Tomovic. Uh, she's a sports medicine uh, specialist here in uh, Serbia, but she's currently working at Thessaloniki. So, uh, Milena, hi, you can turn on the microphone and join us and ask a question. 
Hello to everybody. Hello to Professor Toll. Thank you for this great lecture. I have a question that uh, is rare. We know that hamstring injury is very common in this group of performers. And I'm curious if you have any experience with ballet dancer. As I read in some study, more than 50% of uh, muscle, musculoskeletal injuries in this group of performers are acute hamstring injuries. And do you know if they are using Nordic prevention hamstring program? So I missed a little bit, but I think it's about ballet dancers. Yes, it's about yeah. ballet dancers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what I learned from ballet dancers, uh, and one of the colleagues is also um, working with them, they, they don't come with an, uh, an hamstring injury to a sports medicine physician. Uh, they are a little bit more tough than the, the football players. So the cases we saw is very, very, very limited. Uh, they handled themselves uh, and mostly they are stretch injuries. So very slow stretch injuries. And they know already from themselves that it takes a long, long period. Um, and the question is for me, if, if Nordics will help in this group, because the onset is completely different. It's a slow, very slow stretch injury. And I'm myself, I'm not um, convinced that Nordics will help in this group, but I'm not, yeah, that's never uh, examined before. Okay, but, thank you for your answer, Professor. Okay, thank you, Milena, for, for asking questions. So, um, no more raised hands and uh, still no more new questions in the chat section. Uh, the audience was inspired to, to ask questions to you. So injuries are always inspiring in this forum. Uh, okay, let me see if somebody else will raise hand. No. Uh, okay, if there is no more questions from the audience, please allow me just to ask one uh, for the end. So we went through, through your lecture and uh, through the comment uh, that you had on Professor Popovich uh, question. So uh, we agree that uh, PRP does not uh, take its place in treatment of the hamstring injuries, acute hamstring injuries, and that NMR is often too frequently used in the, the prognosis. So uh, do you have some uh, advice? So how to prevent uh, injuries? So to stop our um, athletes from coming into position to uh, <coughs> to the NMRs, to the treatment. So some advice that you have to, to give us for the everyday practice. Yeah. So in daily clinical practice, if you like it or not, uh, Nordic hamstrings, uh, Nordic curls, they still reduce uh, by 50% the injuries, uh, hamstring injuries. So especially work in football, nobody wants to do them, but nevertheless, one out of two you can prevent with doing simple Nordic exercises. And at our club, we focus a lot on sprint training. So um, to increase the normal load during sprint training during the season, we hope that the next season, when they are stronger than before, with specific sprint training, that we can reduce the re-injury rate in, the, uh, in football. But most evidence, Nordics and the rest, I believe in sprint training, uh, but it's not based on evidence. Well, well thank you. So that is like the, uh, something from the pure practice or something from the field. And yeah. I think that everybody can have uh, a, a, good, uh, a good value for using that in our everyday practice. Uh, so let me see just if there is maybe some more hand that is raised. No and no questions uh, in the chat section. So uh, first I want to thank you once again for um, joining us here at uh, our e-forum. So to having time to, to uh, speak to our audience. I think that this uh, lecture was really interesting and some messages that I'm getting uh, from the audience are that they are really thrilled and it was uh, really inspiring. Uh, 
I would also like to uh, use the opportunity to call everybody to join us the next week. So for the next Thursday, so the Thursday 11th at same time, so 6 p.m., the same place, our homes or offices. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Karim Khan uh, will be uh, presenting the lecture under the title uh, uh, Managing Global Limb Tendinopathies in 2020. What have we learned since 1996? Uh, most probably you know that uh, Professor Khan is the editor-in-chief of British Journal of Sports Medicine, but also the professor in the Department of Family Practice and School of Kinesiology at University of British Columbia in Canada, the former director of Research and uh, Education Center in Espetar, and the scientific director of the Institute of Musculoskeletal Health and Arthritis. So I will ask you to join us next uh, week. Uh, I will send um, on Monday the invitations for this uh, lecture and of course Hans also to you so you can join us if you are uh, free at that time. Uh, so thank you all for joining and thank you Hans for this uh, lovely lecture and I hope we will have the opportunity to meet in person in some conference maybe here in, Bel here in Belgrade. Yeah thanks for the invitation it was really making fun this thanks. Thank you a lot so Bye to everybody.